What's going on, everybody, and welcome back to the channel. Today, I am excited to have Bradley Bollier uh, with me today. We'll, we're going to be talking about the song of the Shattered Sands, but Bradley, first off, how are you doing today? I'm doing good. I'm uh, happy to be here, excited to talk, and, and getting closer and closer to the release, so that's getting exciting as well. So, yeah, I'm good. Yeah, good, good. I know uh, I've been I've been following you for a while uh, you know, throughout this series, um, and also just uh, your your wonderful creations in the kitchen. And I'm always very jealous and always kind of drooling on the other side of the computer <laughs> I see the new thing you're baking. So yeah. I, I just kind of want to know first off, you know, what kind of inspired you to start uh, doing bakes and kind of uh, I, I guess uh, throwing it out on social media. Yeah, I mean it was just kind of um, kind of filler filler uh, in, in a way. Like I didn't want to be all books all the time. Uh, and so it seemed like it's something fun to share. I, I'm, I'm a foodie. I enjoy cooking. I enjoy, I, I often say my, fav my favorite dish to make is one I haven't made before. So I like experimenting and finding new techniques and, uh, and things like that. And kind of sharing that uh, passion is, is enjoyable for me. And, um, and, you know, you make connections that way too. There's tons of other foodies out there and you can talk about what, they like to make what I like to make, you know, whatever. So it's a, it's a fun way to connect outside of, you know, the, the writing genre. I gotcha. I, I was, I'm, I'm curious because uh, I don't know many other writers that kind of do the same thing, but Keelan Patrick Burke actually has his own like Instagram profile where he does all of his baits. I was <laughs> wondering if y'all have ever connected before. And if not, I'm totally going to get you guys connected because yeah, y'all need, need to have like a bake off. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I haven't. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that'd be cool. Okay. Uh, what awesome. was the name again? Uh, Keelan Patrick Burke he's a horror okay. writer okay um he uh he also does cover design uh, his uh design company is called Elder Lemon Designs um okay. he does a lot of covers for uh like indie presses like Silver Shamrock and hmm. uh, a few others but um but he also yeah. writes does novellas and novels so yeah. uh, but that'd be really cool I I'll have to connect you guys that'd be neat yeah I'm always <laughs> trying to up my game in terms of like yeah my Achilles heel is like, after I make these things, like getting a good picture, I always feel like they're kind of like flat or too yellow or, or whatever, you know, and I see some other people's feeds, you know, and they're just amateur, you know, foodie bakers, cooks uh, as well, but man, their plating is so good. And uh, <laughs> I'm sure it tastes good as well, but just they, they do a really good job of the visual side of things too. Yeah. Yeah. But see, my wife and I are like big fans of like, you know, Great British Bake Off. Uh, we just finished watching mm, the second yeah, season of Zumbo's Just Desserts. And mm. so, you know, like, you know, she, she she's more of like the, oh, my gosh, I really want to make something. So we uh, so we try something every now and then. But yeah, I, I am nowhere close to being good at plating. <sighs> if, uh, I don't know if you guys have watched. Um, I think it's called Britain's Best Home Cook or something, uh, something like that. Um, it's Mary Berry. Um, you know, after she left uh, uh, the Bake Off, uh -huh. uh, several years later, there's a, I think they've done maybe three seasons, and there are two seasons available on Hulu, uh, and it's it's quite good. I was uh, I was worried that it was going to be kind of a a knockoff, and it wouldn't like hold up to the Bake Off, but actually, I like it almost as much. Um, okay. And they do kind of it's not just baking; they do just general meals, uh, home meals that include baking sometimes, but it's runs the gamut from appetizers to uh, desserts and mains and stuff. So it's, it's, it's good. Awesome. It's like our yeah. feel good, like watch, you know, it's one of those things yeah. like where we're amazed and we're also like jotting down ideas. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's stressful in a wholesome way. Um, right. If that makes sense, like the, cause the contestants tend to support one another mm -hmm. and they don't like to see each other go. It's, it's, you know, yes, they're competing, but they're not cutthroat about it either which is more kind of an American style reality TV thing. Yeah. Uh, so I really enjoy the, that kind of approach where you, you learn, uh, you, you are at the edge of your seat on sometimes because some of their bakes are just right up to the, you know, the last few seconds and stuff. And yeah, it's a good show. I really like it. Yeah. We, we, uh, we finished Zumbos and I was like, you know, I, I don't, I don't know if I like it as much because, you know, it doesn't have that humble aspect. There's like one guy on there who, who, uh, who just about, just about wins it like right at the end, uh, who was probably like the most humble person I've ever seen on a, on a reality TV show, but it's pretty cutthroat. It's, it's, it's yeah. probably more cutthroat than I've seen <laughs> in, in other shows. And it, what is it called? Zumbo? Zumbo's Just Desserts. It was only okay. two seasons. Um, okay. And I think the reason is, I think he actually ended up like, 
going into like a massive amount of debt and his like oh, his dessert empire i think like collapsed oh no so um so i think the last season hmm. was maybe at the tail end of 2019 or in 2020 but they're okay. both on, i think just the second season's on netflix so we just kind of binged it oh, all right well okay i'll have to check it out i mean it's the designs are neat you know it's just you know you might not like anybody that's on there <laughs> right yeah okay well i'll see um well kind of kind of post that now that we're now that we're both probably hungry um <laughs> i just want to i want to ask Luckily, you bit, ages before oh there you go yeah. <laughs> i want to kind of just ask you you know tell me about yourself tell me how you got into writing uh you know did you read a lot growing up and who some of your influences are yeah i uh i, I grew up in southeastern wisconsin where i still live now I've, I've only been out of state for a handful of years five years in california i, I moved for a software company that i was working for out there and then moved back home when my wife and I were talking about having kids and we wanted to be back by a support system and such. Um, and it was it was during that time actually in California where I started getting serious about writing. Um, so this is, you know, well after college, I dabbled in college, um, wrote a few things in high school, but wrote mostly for assignments, but I enjoyed them. Um, and then, you know, try to try to book uh, for reals in, in college and, and it never got anywhere. Um, I got maybe a third of a book, you know, type of thing and, and sort of got my feet wet. Um, but, uh, but, you know, got pulled away and then I was kind of dabbling with other ideas, uh, for years. Uh, and, and by the time I was, you know, entering, you know, uh, early to mid thirties, I was like, well, I better either really do this, you know, or just stop, you know, because it's taking a lot of time and stuff and I'm getting nowhere. Um, so I, I started going to different conferences and conventions. Um, LostCon, I think was the first one. Um, I met Tim Powers, one of my heroes there. Uh, and uh, kind of got into that life a little bit more. Gen Con also was a big influence. Uh, Gen Con is a big gaming convention. Uh, used to be held in uh kenosha uh well lake geneva which is where the gen comes from in wisconsin they moved to kenosha at parkside university where i grew up i was just like a bike right away um and that's kind of how i got into gaming uh initially and then um they moved to milwaukee and now it's in indianapolis uh and they have a couple other ones that they've tried in europe and socal um but they had a writer's track there as well and so um among others, uh, Gene Raby, uh, Mike Stackpole, Kish Johnson uh, taught uh, seminars there. And I, I took a bunch of those. Uh, and then I started going to writing uh, conferences, you know, to, to learn more about craft. Instead of conventions, it was less Spanish and more writer career and technique oriented. Mm -hmm. um, and then I graduated into like the, the workshop um, circuit. Uh, I did a bunch. I did uh, Bible Paradise and um, Literary Boot Camp uh, with Scott Card, um, Clarion, uh, and then I did several of my own. I ran uh, Wellspring uh, Writers Workshop, which is modeled after the Blue Heaven style, Charlie Finley's uh, style. So it's a it's a one week intensive um, novel uh, critiquing workshop. Um, and it usually has about 12 people, anywhere from you know, maybe 10 to 17 are kind of the, the ranges that you can have. So I ran that for a few years. Um, and then around that time, I got my first uh, real nibble for the, the Winds of Kalakovo. Uh, and so from that point forward, I was you know just writing more books along the way. I started getting into the Song of the Shattered Sands idea wise towards the end of that series. Um, I, I got an agent from the Winds of Palacobo deal, and then we talked with Daw, Daw Books, which is one of my one of my dream publishers. Uh, and we landed with them for the the series, um, and so yeah. So eventually, um, <laughs> actually, I, I shifted to full time writing because I got let go from IBM. They had uh, this big set of layoffs. Uh, they were cutting back on. Uh, they do this once every year, a couple of years, where they'll they kind of adjust how they're approaching their um, uh, their vision, you know, for the company. And so they'll they'll sell some assets, they'll buy other ones, and make adjustments here and there. And so our software that I was working on was this large enterprise-wide software package, 
that helps companies control what their assets are and any problems they might have with them, provisioning them to people, getting them back when they're leaving the company. Um, that, that was starting to contract a little bit. And so they, they let some of us go. So I, I had the option of staying with the company and trying to find a new job, um, but I decided not to. I decided to um, you know, make, the, make the leap. Uh, and so I've been writing full time ever since, and it's been scary and weird and stressful because I'm the main breadwinner, not the only breadwinner. But um, yeah, it's, it adds stress to the equation, but it's it's really enjoyable at the same time doing something I really love. Yeah, yeah, but I say you know it's kind of like uh, I told my wife I was like you know I I think I'm going to quit my salary job. And I'm going to go into something that's just straight commission. So I, did, I went jumped two feet into real estate. What mm. just so happens that same year, uh, my wife doesn't get her contract renewed to be uh, a first grade teacher at the school. And so oh, I ends no. up having to go find a part-time job. I'm like, okay, maybe this wasn't the best time, yeah, right. <laughs> but it like really motivates you to like get stuff done, you know? Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I'm not going to say your know, real estate was my passion, you know, it, I would love to say writing would be my passion, but um, you know, if, if you really enjoy something, you know, that motivation, it, it's not as hard to come by. Now I know there will be some days where it's a lot harder to write than others. Uh, and then, you know, you get those days where like, gosh, I just really, <laughs> I, just, I don't want to do this today. Um, but I have to imagine, you know, eventually kind of once you hit your stride, you know, you really start, that passion really starts coming out into your work. Yeah, um, you know, I, I actually liken the, the two fields, oddly enough, um, together. The, when I did uh, software with IBM, um, I shifted roles towards the end, but initially and a little bit at the end, I was in uh, programming, consulting work and, and customizing the software package, which involved coding. Um, and I really, I, even up to the very end, even to this day, I love programming. I love getting in and, and solving problems through lines of text. It's, it's just really fun to, to figure out how to make that stuff work, like sort of taking a problem, breaking that down into pieces that I can tackle, you know, with, with chunks of code. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I, yeah, I, I, I loved that part of it. I didn't love travel, you know, as part of it. Um, I was, I got away from the programming. It was a Kind of a pre-sales position it got to be very dry document oriented work uh repetitive um and uh and so i, I didn't enjoy that part uh and on the writing side um you know there are stresses that go along with it um it is difficult for me um you know with my personality putting myself out there and asking people to buy my books or or to sort of crow you know about them mm. Um, you know, that was a, something I had to overcome. Um, there are all kinds of other like sort of daily things that get in the way of the writing, but I love the writing part. Like when I can get into the characters, get into the story, something I really enjoy, that, that is just great. Um, and, and, you know, and, and that kind of drives, you know, the rest of it. Um, and I, I, I don't know if that'll ever go away. I hope not. You know, so far that, is, that has maintained itself throughout, I don't know, 17 years now, you know, of kind of serious writing. Uh, and so, yeah, it's, it's just neat looking at it. It's, it's not a problem per se, but it's almost like you're, you're making problems for characters and solving them. So there are some actual parallels between those two worlds. Um, and it's, you know, so it's, it's, it's interesting finding, well, A, creating the problems in the first place, but then B, finding ingenious ways for the characters to get out of them, you know, and, and fun and exciting or, or horrific uh, ways. Yeah. That's awesome. So yeah. uh, who, who I guess um, would be some of your, your influences and who did you, who did you read growing up? Yeah. Um, I mean, Tolkien was my gateway. I had a friend in third grade that had read the, the Hobbit uh, and he recommended them. So I read that and just, I just adored it. I just fell into, you know, fantasy um, you feet first and uh, went on to read the Lord of the Rings. Um, I tried the Silmarillion <laughs> several times. I, I eventually did read the whole, the whole thing, but um, that was a little tougher. Um, so yeah, Tolkien fan. Um, but then, you know, later uh, got into Glenn Cook, um, uh, C.S. Friedman, Celia Friedman, uh, her um, Cold Fire trilogy is one of my favorites of all time. Um, Robin Hobb, uh, later on Guy Gavriel Kay, um, Stephen Donaldson, George Martin, um, 
Yeah, so I mean, my my general, I I don't tend to in, enjoy reading or writing like humorous uh, things. Although I do like, you know, like Douglas Adams. Um, I'm going to call out Nicholas Eames, um, who we interviewed recently. Uh, his Kings of the Wild. I haven't yet read uh, Bloody Rose yet, but I love that book. You know, and it's it's got this super cool mixture of like emotion and and humor and action. Mm -hmm. it's like an, almost like an even mix of all three of those things. It's just a really cool mix along with this really cool like dungeon crawl slash 70s band, you know, uh, the tour thing going on. It's, uh, it's just a really cool mixture. Um, but, you know, so so I, I do tend to like sort of the, I don't know, d dark fantasy, uh, fantasy that's, um, uh, you know, deep and rich, uh, um, and that, uh, you know, has kind of a serious tone, often a slightly, you know, dark, horrific tone as well. Mm -hmm. And I would put even like, you know, some grim, dark stuff like um, George Martin or Abercrombie, you know, into that kind of kind of realm. So that's what I like to sort of like to read. That's what I like to write as well. I gotcha. Yeah, I, I you know, talking to Nick, Nicholas Eames, yeah, his, his books, it, there's just, like you said, there's just that mix that's just, it's perfect. You know, you, yeah. you, you go from action to humor to, you you really just feel for these characters and then all of a sudden it's like oh they're a rock band <laughs> yeah it's, it's just a great just just coagulation of stuff yeah um i yeah, yeah. also recommend uh the black Cox by david rag it's got a, a okay. little bit of a similar feel um i mean every, everybody likened the cover to kings of the wild because it's they're both done by richard anderson but mm. um it's it's got that little bit of humor it's a mercenary uh band type okay. uh novel um and it's also got a little bit of like some dark undertones uh, but it's, mm. it's it's really good so recommend that one and then yeah, yeah Aber one. abercrombie glocked is like my favorite character of all time so. oh yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah and then I, I can't remember if i mentioned glenn cook earlier but you know the mm -hmm. Th that type of thing uh he, he was my first entree into i i don't think grimdark the term was around at that time but the black company was one of my, one of my favorite series of all time um and i just loved the you know going from like tolkien's high um speaking of kings and queens and you know high elves and you know that sort of thing and then going to you know in the trenches with some of those characters and and you know being in the mud and and blood and guts you know in the in the warfare it was just a really cool shift for me to to go to that type of thing um and you know and a lot of other people are, are writing in that kind of kind of vein now mm -hmm. yeah I, I feel like that's that's kind of a shift and it's it's stayed that way uh i feel like everybody really likes those morally great characters or just straight evil characters and just like really get into you know the nitty-gritty of battle with swords going everywhere and arrows you know come you know raining out of the sky mm -hmm. uh, you know, there, there's just something so i don't know i don't, I don't know what it is but just the feeling of reading that type of book versus yeah you know the the age-old coming of age tale <laughs> yeah where where you know this young this young farm hand has had a sword thrust upon him and must go slay the mm -hmm. dragon you know that, yeah I, there, there are still some of those but they're i thought they're a little rarer especially kind of like in the community section that i'm in yeah yeah the uh and there's nothing wrong with either style i really oh, no. still enjoy you know the, the the farm boy farm girl type of type of story it's uh you know it feels nostalgic at this point to be honest um mm -hmm. and it's also it's 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 a romantic look at at fantasy in some ways, uh, whereas um, grimdark, uh, you know, in the trenches type type writing is just a lot more visceral and gritty and real. So it's just you know two ends of a spectrum in, in some ways. Exactly. Um, so as far as your writing goes, uh, how has your process changed? Has it stayed the same? Uh, over the course of these 17 years that you've been seriously writing and full-time writing um and you know are you a plotter are you a pantser are you a mix mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah i mean you know every everybody evolves I, I think um i haven't changed drastically um i i teach writing uh, a fair bit i give seminars uh done these workshops now and again um and I, I talk, I, I say that I thought coming from a programming background that I would be very organized and plot driven. I thought I'd have these like 30, 50 page, you know, sets of outlines. And then I would just, you know, write the scenes based on those. Uh, but I, I could not, and I still cannot 
get into the story and see where things are headed until I start writing. So in other words, I cannot plot fully uh, until I actually start the writing process. But on the other hand, I need a map. I cannot, I cannot go in and be a complete pantser either. Uh, and so I, I fall kind of like halfway in between. I, I outline to um, a light degree, let's say a high level degree. Um, I often make, uh, have the end point in mind. And if it's a series, I, I, I have the end point of the series, the trilogy, whatever in mind as well. Even if I don't know what's going on in those second and third books to any great degree. Um, but then I focus on the first book, you know, what is the first chunk? And I, I come up with th two or three turning points in the novel, high points, low points mm -hmm. uh, before the end. So now I have like three or four like stakes in the ground that, that I, you know, I know where I'm going to, to go or where I'm going to be eventually. And I know where I'm starting. Uh, I, I spend a lot more time, a ton more time than I used to on the backstory. Um, in my my classes again I talk about uh, I used to work at a nuclear power plant um, early in my career before IBM and I did the uh, simulator code and so in the U.S. Uh, every nuclear power plant must have an exact replica of the control room uh, along with accompanying software to model what that um, power plant does when you're when you're bringing it up uh, to power uh, when you're ramping things down for maintenance uh, when there are accidents. So this software um, allowed you to introduce problems along the way or simply train people on how to, to do certain operations. And so you could introduce like a steam break in a pipe or the electrical generators could go down or a rod in the, um, in the actual power, the uh, reactor itself could, could break uh, and that would cause certain things to happen you know, within it. Uh, and so, so what was necessary for all this stuff to happen uh, were what, what was called initial conditions. And so they would, uh, for example, if you were gonna introduce a steam break, you would want the power plant to be up and running. Uh, you could not start from a cold state because it takes literally hours to get to ramp up mm -hmm. um, to, to like full power. So they, they would literally bring the plant up and then they would snap it. They would snap a copy of that condition uh, into memory. And so we had a, like 21 ICs they were called. So they could start um, these training exercises from that point. And so I liken the beginning of a novel uh, of any story um, to those initial conditions. And so we're not starting from, from nothing. The world is in a certain state. The characters are in a certain place in a certain state of mind and they have certain goals. And there are some other people doing things that they're going to want to oppose in some way who have goals that come from a whole line of um, influences, desires, failures, emotional changes in their, in their lives. And so I, that, that's what I work on heavily uh, in, in the beginning, like the, the world, the magic system, but also, you know, what, what are the politics like? Who are the players? Uh, what resources are in contention in, in this place uh, that this uh, story is taking place? Um, and, and so I, I liked, I like stories that with a world that is on the brink of change, what that change is, I don't know, but often it's environmental for me. I, I just kind of enjoy that kind of thing. Uh, and so something is about to, about to change and the main character is involved in that directly. And so it's like, um, a landslide ready to, to fall. Right. And all it takes is a couple of pebbles, uh, for that thing to start crumbling and really start, you know rolling down the mountain. Mm -hmm. um, and so it just takes a lot of work for me to, to get all those boulders up on the hill properly, right? Um, and so, so that's one thing that has changed for me uh, greatly. Uh, the, my first few novels were failures largely because I didn't do this kind of thing. Like I didn't know where I was going. And so the, the story was like flaccid, it was lax. I didn't know what, what the characters wanted in the beginning. There wasn't enough uh, opposition, tension, um, and, you know, I tried to build it along the way, but, but by the time you do that, it's often broken, um, to the point that it cannot be repaired, you know, and, and I didn't know that at the time, of course, but mm -hmm. looking back on it now, I could see that that was the case, you know, so, so I set things up heavily. Um, so I know where things are, are, um, in the beginning, 
Um, and there's this pressure built up and ready to be released. And the inciting incident, that first thing that happens in the first chapter or two in every story, um, is that that flick of the first few pebbles that starts the landslide rumbling, right? Um, and so, so that's that's what I do. I, I set up um, those rocks on the hillside. I, I know where they're headed down the hill and how people are going to avoid them or get hit by them to some degree. And then I call this inchworming my way through the novel. I, I can plot. I find that I can plot about six to eight chapters out. And after that, it just gets too gray for me. I just, I just cannot, I just don't know. I don't know how they're going to, you know, do what they're going to do. I don't know what turns they're going to find uh, or that I can exploit along the way. So I'll plot fairly heavily for about that far, six chapters, say, and then I'll start writing. And then uh, one thing, another thing that's changed for me is that I've gotten very good um, at knowing when I can continue writing and pushing and when I just need to stop. Um, and I, I used to, I used to have all, all kinds of angst over stopping writing. Um, and this, this was a failing, um, and, and maybe for other writers too, sometimes you're pushing writing just to get word count and it's just, it's wasted effort. Um, you're going in the wrong direction and you, you need to take time and don't, don't consider plotting time, thinking time, re, re-envisioning things. Uh, the ideation stage, that is writing. <laughs> and don't, don't think that isn't writing because it is. Um, now, on the other hand, don't, don't get so lost in it that you spend days and days and weeks in doing that. Um, sometimes that can be a mistake too. Sometimes you need to just write an exploratory draft um, and maybe it works and maybe it doesn't. If it doesn't, you know now that that isn't going to work and you can usually find new solutions during the writing. You know, so worst case, maybe you've blown it a chapter or two. So what? Uh, at least you have some new direction. Uh, and so, so I'll get my, my outline for my six chapters. I'll write, and usually by chapter, say, four or five in this list that I have ahead of me, I'll start feeling uncomfortable again. And I'm like, okay, stop. I'm going to take a day or two. So I do. I replot six chapters out, and then I, I go forward again. And, and so I inchworm slowly through the plot. I hit my major turning points go to the next one, go to the next one, get to the end. Um, and that works pretty well for me. Um, uh, it, it helps me have a framework that isn't so rigid um, that I feel like I'm stuck, you know, uh, doing it, especially when I just don't know enough about the characters yet. Um, you know, what, one thing I, I, um, uh, I often talk about is uh, the, the, the characters that I have in the beginning uh, are not the same as the characters that I have at the end of the first draft. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and what I mean by that is I know them so much better and I know their history better. Uh, I know how they've interacted with other characters better. And so that, that those first, first third and two thirds of a, a, a novel are very raw. So I, I call it, uh, it's not, my term, uh, it's the zeroth draft. Uh, it's, a, it's, you know, I've written the, the book, but it is absolutely not ready to be read by anybody. Um, there are so many problems I need to go back and I, I have to take essentially my knowledge of this, these characters and apply it to the beginning of the story. Now that I know who they are and what they're like and what they want and what's stopping them from getting it. Um, and so I, I go through one more full draft, um, fixing a ton of things along the way. And then that is my true first draft. Um, so, so that's, that's changed as well. I'm always looking for like different plotting techniques. And I, so I'll mention one more thing. Yeah. Um, I watched, well, I'll mention two things quickly. Brandon Sanderson has a, um, a taping essentially of his class at BYU. Uh, yeah. It was taped a couple of years ago. I think there's maybe two versions of it. I, I forget. Uh, I think there were some updates to it. Uh, but in any case, it's like the full course, um, and it's great. He's a great teacher. He's super insightful. He's very good at like getting concepts across uh, in an easy way, um, and so uh, well worth watching. You can find it on YouTube. Just look up Brandon Sanderson writing class. Uh, but Dan Wells is a friend of um, Brandon's, and um, he has a he gave a seminar which is a, a seven point story structure. Um, and I've, if I'm getting this right, he, he, he actually, uh, and he admits that he took that he, uh, from a gaming manual, a, a, a role-playing game that uh, it was kind of for GMs and it was kind of telling, trying to pass across like um, 
how, how to craft an interesting story for the characters, but it, it was very applicable to fiction as well. And so those, those seven points just kind of detail what happens at the beginning of the story, how the character gets into um, the, the story itself, the inciting incident. Um, you know, one of the problems that I found was like, uh, there's a, the, people spend a lot of time on say the start of the story and the inciting incident and maybe the ending. And then you'll hear this other term, the muddle in the middle. Uh, and, and that's referring to the, you know, it, it's sometimes easy to see where you're headed because you have so much momentum at the beginning of a story. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of easy at the end because possibilities are being winnowed by the time you get to the end of the story. And, and, and there's just more and more is clear in your mind. So that often writes itself, not always, but um, it tends to be easier than the middle, which is like, full of complicating the, the things that came before and then slowly sort of sort of uh, pruning the possibilities, you know, to, to solve the story, however they can, or the readers can, or the, the characters can. Um, and there's just not a lot of time spent on that kind of thing. And this seven point story structure helped me a lot in the last, last couple of years. I've been using it on uh, some shorter pieces and then um, I have some new, uh, uh, fantasy trilogy and some science fiction stuff that I'm writing. And it's, it's just, it, it helps me uh, uh, to frame, you know, where things are going a lot. And it, instead of just like two or three high points, like I talked about earlier, I can have these seven points uh, to work from and still continue to kind of inchworm my way through the plot and write it. Okay. What, uh, did you say, where, where can you find that uh, seven point structure from Dan? So he's on, that's on YouTube as well. Okay. Um, it's a, it's like, there's a playlist um, because it's broken down into like 10, 10 minute segments. Mm -hmm. So I think there's like, I think there's five of them total. Um, so just Dan Wells, seven point story structure. You'll find it. Awesome. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's so nice how much is out there and really, yeah. really available for people. I mean, I, I've seen Sanderson's talks all over the place. Um, mm -hmm. You know, now, I mean, I know it's, it's a, a subscription thing, but you get the masterclass uh, yeah. stuff out now with like Neil Gaiman and NK yeah. Jemison. Um, and, uh, and then of course, you know, I think they still do, you know, even with COVID, they still got some like online workshops and so forth that you can go into. But yeah, it's, it's, it's so awesome. Then you got all the books on craft, like King and Jeff Vandermeer. And, mm. and, and, and so like, I'm, I'm like, I'm trying to pull all this knowledge in, just be like, okay, I've got to read and listen to everything and then like pick apart and take notes. And <laughs> cause I'm, I'm really wanting, like, I've been talking about this for, like, for years and my wife was like, just freaking do it. But like, I've, I've really wanted to sit down and write and I've got an opening chapter and I just, I don't know if it's time. I don't know if it's like, I'd just rather read. I don't know. I don't know what's holding me back from continuing, but uh, I figured, you know, maybe if, if I can read some more and get maybe a little more enthusiastic and motivated about it, I can continue it. So, so yeah, that, that definitely helps. I want to, <laughs> I want to know more about the craft and really, yeah. really deep dive. Yeah. I, I will put in a plug for lit reactor. Uh, right. They it's litreactor.com. Um, they have masterclass-like classes. Uh, uh, the master classes, which I joined for a year as like a birthday present, and I watched a bunch of those, including Gaiman's. And um, Dan Brown's was actually probably my favorite uh, of really? all the ones that I saw. It was, yeah, he, was, he, was, he broke down um, structure in an easily consumable. And he's, he's talking about like writing thrillers specifically, uh, but I like that style. I like adding a little bit of that style to my writing as well. Um, I think we can learn from any genre, even if you're not writing in that genre, because something in that can apply to parts of your story without right. a doubt. Um, so, so those ones are, are just talks essentially, you know, a, a number of talks. Um, and they, I think they have some like workshop type things, but it's like work on your own, you know, type mm -hmm. thing. Um, Lit Reactor is more interactive. Um, it has, uh, it's often one, two, four week classes uh, and you work with an instructor um, and it's not quite workshop level. I wouldn't say that, but, uh, generally the assignments are such that, you know, you might spend two, three, four hours working on it, one, one a week, uh, and then turn that in, maybe a bit of writing, maybe some plotting, outlining, you know, something like that, maybe a generating a synopsis, you know, and maybe hmm. that's what the course is on or a world world building course. Uh, and the instructor will then review that material and, you know, and, and give you some tips and stuff. Uh, and so I've done a number of courses uh, on there and 
So we have a bunch of other authors. And so you can find topics that really speak to, you know, what you want to learn more about. They're not, they're, they, don't, they don't tend to be just how to write, you know, they're right. how to write thrillers or horror or, or how to plot, uh, how to world build, you know, that side of thing. So, so you can find the topics that kind of speak to you and where you need to some shoring up, you know? Okay. Awesome. So I want to talk about Song of the Shattered Sand. So uh, excuse me while I, while I run down because I, I just, I just am in love with your titles. They're, they're just so amazing. So, so we've got uh, the prequel called Of Sand and Malice Made. And yeah. then you've got five novellas. You've got, I'm, I'm going to have to look at my phone for this because there's so many of them. So The Flight of the Whisper King, The Doors at Dusk and Dawn, The Tattered Prince and the Demon Veiled, and The Village Where the Bright Wine Flows, and A Wasteland of My God's Own Making. It's just like, come on, man. Come on. All right. <laughs> then, you got, then you got six novels. So the, the six main novels in the series. Uh, the, 12, the 12 Kings of Sherakai with Blood Upon the Sand, A Veil of Spears, Beneath the Twisted Trees, When Jackals Storm the Walls, and then lastly, which is about to come out, uh, A Desert Torn Asunder. So first off, um, what inspired you to write this sprawling epic fantasy series? Uh, I mean, you know, six books in itself is, is a pretty big feat on top of a prequel, which is pretty much a full you know, novel. And then, uh, and then you've got five novellas. So what, what was the inspiration behind this entire series? Yeah, it's, it's hard to pinpoint exactly. Um, but certainly, um, I'm going to forget the name of the series. So CJ Cherry wrote a, a science fiction, I think it's a trilogy. And I think there was more stories written in this universe after that. Um, so a science fictional spacefaring, uh, but they, they landed on a, a world uh, with um, uh, Arabic uh, cultures uh, and interacted with them. And, I, and that was probably my, my first um, exposure and Dune as well, although I think I read Cherry uh, first. Uh, and so it has, it has been in the back of my mind for, you know, since my teen years uh, and um, Eventually, I started to explore it in my first trilogy, The Winds of Falakovo. The, uh, the, the story starts on these cold, um, inhospitable islands, these archipelago chains, which are duchies in the Grand Duchy. Um, and one of those duchies is Kalakovo. Uh, and, and so that's where our story begins. But it eventually shifts to the mainland where uh, this giant continent where there's an empire which the uh, the Grand Duchy used to be a part of, um, and so there's uh, it's it's a it's giant, and we we eventually find a a desert uh, based culture, somewhat secretive uh, uh, group that has been kind of uh, kept separate, uh, uh, purposefully you know away from uh, the the rest of the neighboring kingdoms, um, and so we we are introduced to those. And it was just fun for me to explore that a little bit. Uh, I, I eventually wrote a novella called uh, From the Spices of Samandira, uh, which is where I first explored this idea of sand ships. So ships that have these um, skim wood, it's called. Uh, it's almost like um, ice uh, boats. You know, they have these um, struts and skis, you know, so that uh, boats can sail on the ice, essentially. Uh, and it, so it's that sort of concept. Um, and I just applied the age of sail, you know, to the desert essentially um, in this story. Uh, and so Sanandira eventually became Sharakai. I mean, it, this is really a re-envisioning of, of that story. So it's its own story. It's set in its own universe. Um, but that was yet another stepping stone to like the full blown big epic story, you know, that is the Song of the Shattered Sands. Um, and so, you know, I kind of kind of crept, you know, toward this larger story in, in steps, um, but it's been super satisfying to write it because I've been wanting to do it for, for years. And, you know, once you start a story that, you know, the Winds of Calicobo, I, you know, you get to finish, you know, what you start. And then, um, so it just took me time to, to, to get to it. And once I did, you know, I was, I was a better craftsman at writing and, and it was a wider story than I had tackled before. Uh, and so I'm glad I had, you know, a, another um, slightly 
more compact story, The Winds of the Lays of Anaskaya, under my belt before I tackled it. Um, and so, so yeah, so, um, you know, I don't know where it came from, you know, all those things I kind of, you know, worked into it. And, and the more, the more that I wrote in that type of war, the more I, I, I liked it, you know, and then I wanted to bring my own flair to like an Arabian Nights, uh, Thousand and One Nights, you know, type of story. Um, so that's what, that's what I was trying to do with it. Okay. Awesome. Uh, so, so Cheda, uh, she's a pretty remarkable female POV uh, and is, you know, your main, your main character throughout the series. Yeah. What were, uh, what were the influences behind her? Um, you know, I don't know if I have any uh, direct influences exactly. Um, you know, I, I do, I do like having, even in the Winds of Kalakobo, I had one male character who, who was the main as Cheda is the main character in uh, the song of the Shattered Sands, but I had two other characters who were both female and I wrote similar, uh, similar way in that I had three POV characters uh, in Shattered Sands. I have many more as it turns out, but I started, I actually started writing the story with <laughs> the stated goal to myself of writing an epic from a single POV. I was, and in fact, my first draft was only Cheda. She was the only POV character. And I found that I was trying, I was going through all these weird literary gymnastics contortions to try to get other parts of the story out. Uh, like the kings, what are they doing? The, in Sharakai, there are these 12 kings who have ruled the desert, the Shangazi desert for hundreds of years. And they are long living, apparently immortal. Uh, and they, they have ruled with an iron fist. Uh, they guard, you know, their rule very closely. Uh, and of course there are people, they have made enemies along the way. Um, and, uh, and so they, they put those uh, sort of threats down uh, viciously uh, when, when they crop up. Um, and so I, I needed to get their point of view out as well. And it was just, it was just too difficult. So long story short, I started writing more PV characters. Cheda was still the main character for sure, but I added her, her best friend, Emery, uh, another character, Ramad Amansir from a Southern kingdom, which is based off of, um, Spain, loosely Moorish Spain. Um, I added King Hassan, uh, one of the, our main viewpoint character for the Kings. Um, and he has a lot of machinations going on that maybe don't align with all the other Kings. Um, and so, so it kind of, you know, evolved a little bit from there. Um, and so, so yeah, so Cheda, I, I just, I just wanted to, to, you know, to do my take on strong female protagonist, um, uh, and, and, and see what, what became of it. Um, uh, and she, she eventually, um, when, when the story begins in 12 Kings and Shark High, um, she, uh, we learned that she lost her mother when she was young, uh, and she doesn't know why until the story starts to open up. Um, uh, the Kings killed her, uh, for reasons we don't understand, but what that did was, um, it, it, it took away from Cheda a lot of the knowledge that she would have gained had her mother still been alive and her mother had plans for Cheda as we, as we learn eventually. Um, but uh, as the story progresses, we also learn that um, Cheda and her mother are from a particular group of people in the desert. Uh, and I won't go further than that to avoid spoilers, but um, part of, part of what I wanted to explore was like the, the loss of culture um, you know, a, a culture of people uh, being almost decimated um, by the kings and their cruel ways, and what that would mean to somebody. Um, so not only does Cheda not know, you know, where she came from and her mother came from uh, in the desert. She knows her, her mother came from the desert, but not which tribe. There are 12 tribes in the desert. Um, and so part of it, uh, the story that I wanted to explore through Cheda and, and sort of her mother is like, the idea of lost heritage and how you can regain it, uh, you know, what parts of it are saved. Uh, and because so much has been lost, the things that are saved are probably the ones that are most important to those people. Uh, and, and so, so I really liked that idea um, that, you know, even though her mother was gone, she is a, she is the connection 
from Cheda to her people, which she eventually finds um, and, and connects with. And, and then Cheda's um, mission, her goals change. Um, she starts out, it starts out as a revenge story, essentially, but it becomes a, a story about saving, you know, a people and then also saving the desert, you know, so like saving the, the, the tribe that she came from, liberating them, but also saving the people of the desert itself. So it, it, it changes and morphs over time. So that really attracted me to um, Jada, her mother, and their backstory. Okay. Um, so, so my co-contributor, Blaze, uh, had a couple questions. And uh, his first one was, what, what was one of the, you know, the most remarkable things for him was uh, the poems of the Twelve Kings. Hmm. Uh, how long did it take you to think of and write them down? Hmm. Interestingly enough, that was the first thing that I wrote in, in this story. Uh, I, I knew, uh, I developed the concept of the kings, the 12 kings of Sharkai, having gained their power from the desert gods. Um, but along with those powers come weaknesses, you know, so the, the gods are, uh, are not that generous. Um, and so these poems, um, that um, Shada discovers in a book left to her by her mother, um, there are hidden, yeah, hidden poems. And each, each one has two stanzas. One describes the power of the king, the other one describes their weakness. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I spent, oh gosh, it, it was a good two, three weeks um, just developing that poem. So there's um, two stanzas for each king. So that's, um, 24 already and then there's uh one for a lost king and then there's some you know kind of the, the beginning there's two bookend uh stanzas you know so it was, it was it was pretty long and i i modeled it after um some of tolkien's uh all those who wander are not lost uh, you know, the, uh the one describing aragorn um and uh yeah so that, so that took a while and i talked to a bunch of um people who um like poetry, I've written poetry to, to try to get it down. Um, and then, so that that allowed me to, I wanted that all like set in stone because I knew I was gonna sort of dole them out over time. Uh, the, the Kings, of course, knew about those poems and they knew that their weaknesses could be learned by others. And so they suppressed the knowledge of them. Uh, they refused to allow them to be written. Anybody who spoke of them were killed. Um, and so over time they became lost. Um, and so part of the story, um, it's not just, just about lost heritage, it's about uncovering some of the past. Um, and then one of the more interesting things that uh, I didn't know this in the beginning, but eventually the, you know, the, I had to answer the question, why would the gods have done this in the beginning? What, why would they have given them the, the king's power to begin with? What's in it for them? Um, and I wanted it to be more than, than just some fickle reasoning on their part. And they have a very specific goal in mind that becomes clear over the course of the novels um, and is now coming to fruition in the final book. Uh, and, and so there's a kind of these levels. There's, you know, Cheda is, she represents kind of the streets in the beginning. She grew up poor. Um, she's in this uh, slums in the West end of the, of the city. And, and she becomes exposed to the upper you know, halls of power you know, as, as time goes on. Um, so we see the kings and, and their purposes. And then we see the gods and their purposes above all of that. You know, so there's kind of like games within games going on. And that poem drove all of that stuff. And it was, it was just so like fulfilling. Like sometimes you, you find these ideas uh, for stories and they just click and you're like, oh, that's, that's perfect. You know, sometimes you read them, like frankly, you know, Nick Eames um, and his idea, I'll, I'll mention China Mieville too, The City in the City um, is a brilliant novel. It's one of my absolute favorite books. Um, and, it, and just the, this concept of having two cities like coexist in the same place. And the only reason they coexist is because people agree that they're two different places. They're like memes, um, you know, uh, in city form. Mm. Uh, and um, so, yeah, so the, the, the poems uh, really helped crystallize so much as, as time went on. And I, I really had no idea that was going to happen. So I was, I was happy that I spent all that time in the beginning. And I will mention that the, the, the last chapter uh, of, the, of A Desert Torn Asunder is the full poem. I wanted to add that for readers at the very end, just as kind of a 
you know, uh, a, a nice breath, you know, of uh, deep breath after the, the series is over. Um, so that, that was fun to, to put in and reread. Like I hadn't revisited the whole thing um, many times. I often went back to that to sort of think about how Cheda and others are going to learn about some of the kings and, and in fact, what their weaknesses are, where they, some of, some of their histories. Um, uh, but, you know, having, you know, put it in and then reading through the entire story and then coming to that at the end and then listening to it with Kate Redding's, you know, voice as I was doing the audio production, uh, it was just, it was just really satisfying for me to, to finish it up that way. Mm, awesome. Uh, he also asked, uh, so, only in book one do we get flashback chapters for Chato. Why? Why the change? Um, there's uh, there's fewer in book two, but there are some. Um, so so initially, I thought I might continue that throughout, um, and and I will I will fess up to being influenced heavily uh, by um, Scott Lynch uh, and the Lies of Locke um, which which does that quite a bit. And I just really enjoyed them. And th those are very tricky to do. Like you really need that backstory to be every bit as interesting as the front story, mm -hmm. uh, the story in the here and now. And that's not always true in a lot of books. And, I, and so I, I knew the danger um, and I was, uh, I, was, I was worried about including them at all. Um, and so as, as time went on and we, we learned about Cheda, I just didn't feel like there was enough of interest that had bearing, you know, that's another thing. Like it, ha it has to reflect on, it has to be a story in its own right, but it also has to reflect on what's going on right now because backstory is by its very nature, lower tension. Mm. Cause we know they live. <laughs> we may not know what they went through exactly, but it's just, it's just difficult. It's more, it's a challenge to, to get readers into those sections. Mm. And Scott does an amazing job of it, I think. Um, and so, so that's, that's what I was trying to do in the first one. Um, I, I will also fess up that the flashback chapters, I actually wrote it in chronological sequence on the first draft. I started her out as young and then aged her up significantly after her mother died. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I felt that didn't work. That wasn't the real, it wasn't the, the true start of the story. I, I had to start uh, where she comes across. And in the first book, she we, we learn fairly early on that she, um, that she lost her mother to the Kings. Uh, they killed her and did so in a, in a very violent way. Um, and we don't know why. And, um, you know, eventually that starts to, to, we understand, you know, why that happened. So, you know, one of the flashbacks is seeing her mother's death, um, going to visit this desert, witch, who we learn more about later. Um, and then, um, yeah, so the, I mean, the real start had to be as close as possible to the point where Cheda starts to find out who her people are. Um, and again, she doesn't really know. And it's involved with her mother's death. It's also involved with the kings. It's also involved, I haven't mentioned these, with the Asirum. And, uh, and the Asirum are these strange creatures, kind of, um, um, kind of, kind of zombie-like. They're ghouls, uh, um, in essence. And they live beneath these trees. They live in the roots of these trees, these magical trees that were planted at the time of when the kings gained their power. And the kings gained their power so they could stop this invasion of the 12 tribes. Uh, the 12 tribes are these nomadic tribes that um, saw Sharakai, this permanent place, uh, as an insult to, to their way of life. Uh, they, they believed in and believe in constantly roaming a nomadic lifestyle um, and they were also, are also xenophobic and they didn't like all the influences coming from other countries to the desert through Sharakai. And so they wanted to raise it. Um, and they were on the cusp of doing so when the kings made their bargain with the gods. Uh, and, and so, so that comes into play that it, and the way that um, one of the powers that the kings were granted were these creatures. And so they live under these trees once per month, they come into the city and they take tribute. Um, and no one understands who they take or why they take them, but, but one king in particular, Sukuru, the Reaping King, he has a whip and he like strikes people's doors uh, to mark them as to be called, you know, by the Asirum. And so the Asirum come in, they take people and they go back out to the desert and they are thrown to the trees. 
and the trees sort of consume them and drink mm. their blood in essence. Um, and so, um, uh, where was I headed? What, what, tell me, tell me the question again. What was I doing? <laughs> I was saying, uh, the, the, the about flashbacks. The flashbacks. Yeah. Yeah. So we, um, so we learned more about, um, the serum and, and, uh, and eventually um, um, that opened up a bunch of stuff too. The Asirim are related to Jada's heritage. I won't take it farther than that. Um, and so, yeah, so the flashbacks uh, initially were a way to kind of explore some of that stuff, but I, but I, wanted, I wanted to get close to the point where Jada meets the Asirim properly for the first time. She knows of them, of course. She hears them every month. She fears them like the rest of the city does on the, on the night that they come in for the culling. Um, and, um, and so, so that, that's how it ended up. And, um, uh, I, I added the flashbacks so we could understand more about where she came from and have, I needed some touch points with her mother. Uh, her mother was so important to, um, to get Shada to, to understand where she came from and to, to understand more about the serum and the Kings and the gods and their dark bargain. Um, and I didn't like uh, telling it all through like narrative uh, and even dialogue. I really wanted the readers to see uh, Aya, Aya Nesh is her mother. Uh, and so in, in the second novel, the need for that uh, just decreased. You know, I, I, I still had a, a few places where I wanted to, to show uh, bits of that. And by the third novel, um, it, it was all but completely unnecessary. Um, and so I, I, I did think about continuing that um, flashback style, um, but it, it just didn't feel worth it narratively to me. So yeah, so it just fell by the wayside. I gotcha. Uh, so what can readers expect in desert? So, so in the, so in the beginning, um, and I, I will say just quickly, the 12 Kings in Sharkai is a nod to another of my major influences, Roger Zelazny. Mm. Um, he wrote, the Amber series, the Amber Chronicles. And the first book is Nine Princes in Amber. So 12 Kings in Sharkai is just a nod to him. Those are some of my favorite books of all time as well, uh, the Amber series. Um, and so, um, in the, so in the, in the first sets of books, I, uh, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna give credit to Scott again. I was at a convention with him, Scott Lynch, uh, and he was talking about uh, some of the other authors that, that he enjoys who wrote series, but tried to um, make each one, it, it wasn't just a big story broken up into chunks. Um, each one had its own theme and sometimes even its own style. And they added to the whole story, um, but, um, but, but could almost be looked at, not quite standalones, but something like that. Mm -hmm. And so he tried to do that and I think has succeeded uh, with The Lies of Lapamora, which is kind of a Ocean's Eleven heist, you know, type story, and then Red Skies over Red Seas, um, which is like piracy, you know, thieves on water. Uh, and then, you know, we, we third book, we, uh, we get into like politics. Um, and, and then eventually the other books, you'll have, you know, espionage uh, involved. And so each one is sort of a different flavor of thief uh, in essence, uh, but, but still are telling, you know, the a continuing story of, uh, of Locke um, and his gang. So I tried to do that a little bit with uh, the Shattered Sands series. You know, the first, uh, the first book, 12 Kings, is, is really about Shada understanding um, who she is and where she came from um, and understanding the problem at hand and, and um, the serum uh, and what they represent. And then in the next, uh, so she, she, she kind of, she's kind of a, a street thief, you know, in, in the beginning. Um, uh, she's a gladiator in these um, gladiatorial pits. That's how she sort of earns a living. Uh, and in the second novel, she uh, insinuates herself into the lives of the king. So it becomes more of a, a view of Sharkai from um, on high. Uh, there's a mountain in the city called the Mont Toriat, and on it are these 12 palaces, for one for each of the kings. And so she sees life from inside of those walls. Um, and so I wanted to, to show that side of Sharkai. And then in the third book, we go into the desert. Uh, and so we see what the tribes are like. And all the while, Chita is coming into her own. She's becoming a leader. 
Um, she's making mistakes along the way. She's making enemies. She's making allies. Uh, and so uh, over the course of the arc of uh, the, the story, um, we get threats from neighboring kingdoms who have long coveted Sharkai. They've wanted Sharkai for their own. Uh, we also see the, the rise uh, of the desert tribes uh, who have long wanted the destruction of Sharkai. And so all these forces are coming into play. But the thing that, that uh, arcs above them all is the, the plans of the gods. They had a, a very specific purpose for giving the kings their power and giving them the Asirum and the, the Atakara trees, those twisted trees that, that drink the blood of people in the desert. Um, and that is coming to fruition in, in the final novel. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna go too much farther than that, but essentially um, their plans have unfolded and now it is, it is very serious. And it's up to Cheda to make people understand that we can no longer think about just Sharkai. We can't think about just the desert. We can't think about just your kingdoms, you know, that border the, the great desert. We have to think about each other and we have to stop the gods. So it's it's partly, um, you know, her evolution as a character and, and showing her and her friends, her allies rising to the occasion, you know, to, to essentially battle the gods and stop the destruction of the desert. Okay. So twofold question for you. Uh, yeah. What is it like finally reaching the end of the series, of this series in particular, mm -hmm. and what's next? So the, um, like, like any book or series, it's, it's always bittersweet for me. You know, like I, I've spent close to a decade with these characters at this point uh, and the world, and, and I really enjoyed it, you know, up to the very end. I still enjoy it. I, I, I do have a, a follow-on tr trilogy I'm considering, with some of the characters who, who make it to the end. Um, and um, at the same time, I'm ready for something new. Like I, I have been writing for 10 years and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm ready for something new uh, as well. Um, so it was bittersweet. I'm, I'm, I'm really happy with how things turned out. I hope readers agree. Um, I, I really enjoyed writing those final few chapters, especially um, because I had I had some of not some of that I, I knew where things were going to end up and I, I I actually had envisioned a scene and how it was going to play out from almost the very beginning you know after I understood the the what the gods were trying to do um, the ending sort of crystallized for me and so I've been just eager to write that thing uh, but I couldn't I couldn't until I wrote everything else you know and so it was just, it was there waiting for me um, and it and it was just so satisfying to to get that down on paper and then to um, each time I came across it, um, it just it just felt really good to me. You know, again, hopefully that translates to readers as well. Uh, I hope people enjoy it. Um, and then that, putting that poem at the end too was just uh, just very sweet. You know, I um, I don't I don't often tear up uh, at my writing. Maybe, maybe you know once per book kind of thing. But at the end, I just got really teary eyed about not letting it go. Just just like that the story was complete. It just you know just felt like a, an emotional release, you know, yeah. uh, to a degree. Uh, so that was good. Uh, and then, um, you know, I am looking forward to, to other things. I've had a, some other uh, trilogies under contract for a bit now. Uh, the, the next one that's coming out is a book called Absinthe, uh, which is a deco punk novel. So it's a uh, reimagining of 1920s Chicago uh, and there's a character named Liam who was a World War I vet. Um, and we find out that the World War I was not in fact fought on European soil. Uh, it, was, it was a different sort of storyline where that war was fought on North American soil. Hmm. Um, and Liam thinks he knows why that war was fought, but he's not right. Um, he suffered a head injury towards the end of the war, or so he thinks. Um, he discovers fairly early on um, that the government uh, is after him um, and he has remained hidden, um, unbeknownst to him. He doesn't even know that sort of they were after him. They didn't know where he was, but they stumble across him and he stumbles across them. And it sets into motion uh, a number of things, including a, an experiment that he was part of uh, during the war that gave him certain abilities. Hmm. Um, and then he has to learn to master those abilities uh, and defeat uh, sort of the, the evil plans of the, the leadership uh, of, the, uh, of the United States. Um, and 
um, in order to, to save not just America, but the world. Uh, and so it's got, um, you know, it's, it's uh, I lean heavily into like 1920s, uh, ro roaring 20s um, style, uh, clothing, cars, um, uh, Tommy guns, uh, and, and, but bring like a, um, a, a sci-fi flair to it. Um, so uh, think like uh, Nikola Tesla, you know, type, type wild retro futuristic technology um, in that kind of setting. So that's absent, that's coming out in December. Um, and then I've just broken ground. Um, I, mean, I, I wrote a partial a while ago, but I'm getting back into a, my next uh, fantasy uh, trilogy, which is a gonna be a sort of a dragon based uh, fantasy and a bit more Western European. Um, I'm always trying to put my own flair on it. Mm -hmm. um, but it essentially follows a, a thief uh, who is bonded with a dragon. Um, and he comes from these lowlands, uh, which were conquered not so long ago by people from the highlands, from the mountains. Um, and so they have, a, they have an empire with five ruling cities. Uh, and he, his, his um, foster father was killed uh, by the empire for bonding with dragons. And in fact, teaching the main character, Rylan, to bond with dragons. Uh, and so Rylan feels, A, very angry with the empire, but also B, responsible in a way because his uncle was killed, his foster parent was killed because he was teaching him how to bond with dragons. And during that, that event, uh, the dragon he was trying to bond with, its parent is also killed. Um, this adult dragon is killed by, and I, I'm, I'm leaning pretty heavily into my d, d background. I have in the lowlands are the colored dragons. So like, you know, blues and greens and blacks. And in the highlands and the mountains are the, um, the silvers, the golds, and one I call the endurium, which is like a platinum dragon. Uh, and so this viridian dragon, the parent is killed. And so they both, uh, both Rylan and this dragon, this young dragon whelp uh, that he eventually bonds with, lose parents. In, at the same time. And so they bond with each other in a, in a very close way. Um, and then fast forward a number of years, Rylan turns into a thief in essence. He's a Robin Hood type character. Um, and he stumbles across a, a chalice. Um, and this chalice is, is wanted by some patron that he's supposed to give it to. Um, but it turns out to reveal some secrets that the empire dearly wants hidden. And he doesn't know what those secrets are yet. Uh, and in fact, he loses that chalice shortly after gaining it. And so uh, he gets wrapped up with someone, um, uh, a young woman who is also a, a dragon rider, but she's like a, a Sherlock Holmes type character. Uh, and she is assigned to a case to find the person who tried to steal this chalice, mm. Rylan. Um, and so they get wrapped up with each other. Um, um, he's very like loose. She's very stiff. Um, but she's also like, you know, very insightful, like Holmes is, um, he's like a kind of a very emotional character. Uh, and so they just kind of get wrapped up uh, with each other and they, they must work together, uh, to find out what this chalice means and why the empire is so interested in hiding what it could reveal. Um, and so it kind of flows from there. So I'm, I'm kind of, I have avoided consciously um writing like a dragon story writing like something in in western you know europe um because I, I i you know i wanted to sort of make my mark i wanted to write something that you know that isn't so well trodden um and so it took me a long time to find something where i i felt like i was bringing something new to the table and i think i finally have so i'm, I'm really excited to write this one Awesome. All right. Yeah. My last question I got for you, and you can thank Christian Cameron for this, uh, because <laughs> anytime I see somebody with a weapon on screen, I have to ask about it. So <laughs> is there a story behind the blade that's st that's sitting yeah. behind you? Not, not much of one. Um, oh, this one. Yeah, this one's a sweat hilt rapier. Um, it's all because of Christian Cameron and Sebastian <laughs> the <Yeah>. Castle. <laughs> Yeah, so um, this one is from Museum Replicas, um, and I came across them, uh, Gen Con, that gaming convention. Several different weapons makers over the years have, have had booths there, um, and they were one of them. And so it's just a really pretty blade. Um, yeah, just, just really nice. 
Um, and so I, uh, you know, every, every year I would go and I would look at the different stores and I like drool over them. And then eventually, you know, I got an actual job that paid real money um, and decided to, to get it because I just enjoy it. Right. Um, <laughs> another one I have is a Italian basket hilt, uh, Shiavona. Um, so this one is kind of wow. similar in style, just a, a much wider blade. It's, it's a lot heavier. Um, yeah, it's just pretty. Yeah, absolutely. So, so no stories. I, you know, I, I actually went to, um, uh, Christian, Let's see, I'm going to, I'm going to forget the acronym, the group that he, that he goes to, but there's, um, people, uh, WMA, uh, Western martial arts, something, I forget what the W at the end is for. Um, so it's a group that is our, our enthusiasts, uh, um, of Western martial arts training, you know, and so if anybody knows, if you know Christian Cameron, you know that he, he goes to those events, he goes on these like long, um, hikes, uh, journeys, uh, cross country and tries to do everything, uh, as they would in period. Yeah. Uh, and I've seen him fight. So that in Racine, where I live, Racine, Wisconsin, there's a meeting, and I'm going to forget the name of that too, but once every two years, uh, there, there's a meeting of the, the these, these groups, these people, uh, and they have like, they have training sessions. Um, so, uh, you can learn about specific, uh, say pike fighting style or long sword fighting styles or, uh, sword and buckler, um, different kinds of shields, uh, any kind of, of fighting during that era from probably, you know, 1100 to, you know, 1800s, you know, kind of thing, um, will be taught there. Um, and so he even let me, lent me a sword and I got to, to, to fight with, you know, a really long two-handed sword for a little bit. That was fun. Um, so, you know, I've, I've been on the periphery of that stuff, but I, uh, um, I have not dove into it yet. It's, uh, expensive, um, and, <laughs> and just takes a ton of time. It. It's like, it feels like something where you, you, you have to be ready to kind of dive in and, and really embrace it. Um, yeah. otherwise you're probably wasting your time and money. Um, but I do like, I mean, cause it's just down the road, literally, um, I've gone there the past couple of times and just. I just like being in those environments, you know, yeah. and just kind of, you know, listening to the sound of swords clanging, you know, and, and the thump of a sword on a wooden shield and um, the, the the clank of armor is, as the, you know, they have these matches between armored um, opponents, combatants. Um, and that's just interesting. That's good to soak up, you know, as a, as a writer and stuff uh, to see those things. So, um, so yeah, I'll show you one last thing. Um, I was actually just thinking about uh, mailing Christian about this and, and saying like, why, why is this so uncomfortable? You know, it's, <laughs> it's just like an empty metal thing. It's, it's terrible to put on your head. Um, but it looks nice on the outside. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't, I don't know if you've ever watched any of his writing fighting videos, uh, yeah. but I mean, I, I know that the sounds that you're mentioning, you know, are probably, you know, a thousand times better in person, but yeah, just listening to the armor clanks and, <laughs> you know, getting, getting a sword hilt to the back of the head. <laughs> it's, yeah. It's, it's, you know, it feels good. And he was, uh, he was on uh, a few days ago and he was talking about how he's going to start riding camping this summer. Cause it's oh, his, right. like his favorite thing to do. And you mentioned his yeah. journey about trying to do everything, you know, that they did in the time period. So I'm yeah. really looking forward to that. If, if you, you yeah, know, yeah. those videos, yeah. um, but Bradley, uh, just thank you so much for, for coming on and, and chatting today. Uh, and everybody, A Desert Torn Asunder, so the last book uh, and the Song of Shattered Sands comes out on July 13th. Um, and I, I don't know about everybody else who's watching this, but I, I'm looking forward to the, the two novels that you mentioned that you're working on now and that, that are coming out soon. Uh, those sound fantastic. I, I'm big on Tommy Guns. I mean, I, I read yeah. a lot of fantasy, but so, something yeah, yeah. about gangsters and <laughs> really yeah. gets to me. And, uh, and yeah, the spin on dragons. I mean, we can spin them all different kinds of ways. So I'll, I'll look forward to that for sure. Um, but yeah, just uh, again, thank you. Uh, look forward to uh, reading the finale um, and we'll have to do this again sometime. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Thanks for having me on and uh, happy reading everybody. Absolutely.